Electronic circuits are made up of electronic components. The first step in learning electronic circuit design, circuit repair, circuit analysis is to know the components and their functionality. There are countless electronic components and each of them has different subsets which makes it difficult to learn them. In this video, I will talk about six electronic components and I will describe their functionality, their mechanism of operation. By the way, this is the first episode of basic electronic components series. I will cover more components in upcoming episodes. Please stay with me until the end of this video and also until the end of this series. The first component we are going to discuss is so predictable. Component number one, resistor. I think this tiny component is the most simple and famous component ever. Even Mr. President knows about it. No, he doesn't. Resistors are used to limit current or manipulate voltage. This is the most basic definition and usage of resistors. This is a schematic symbol of an ordinary resistor. This one is a variable resistor and this one is a potentiometer which is a type of variable resistor. Resistors are used to limit current. So this is why we use a resistor on base terminal of a transistor or in series with an LED. Resistors have several parameters to consider, but their resistance and power are the most crucial. Their resistance is represented by the uppercase letter R and the power is represented by the uppercase letter P. Their resistance is measured in ohms symbolized by the Greek letter omega and is marked by the color bands around the component. The power is measured in watts symbolized by the letter W and can be guessed by the size of the resistor. Both of resistance and power are inherent features of the component. So if you are about to buy a resistor, you have to ask the vendor for the exact resistance and power. For example, these are resistors and each of them has a specific resistance value determined by the colored bands. Also, you can use a multimeter to find the resistance value. But the power of all of them is equal to a quarter watt. On the other hand, we have these, all of which are 100 ohm, but they have different power values. This one is a 1 eighth watt. This one is an ordinary a quarter watt resistor. This one is a half watt resistor. This one is a 1 watt resistor. This one is a 2 watt and this one is a 3 watt resistor. The main difference between different watts is the maximum voltage they can withstand. By using this simple Ohm's law equation and the power equation, the maximum voltage for a 100 Ohm 3 watt resistor will be 17.32 volts and for a 100 Ohm 1 watt resistor it will be 10 volts. Also resistors are available in many other shapes, sizes and specifications. Array resistors, shunt resistors, potentiometers, varistors, etc. They can be used as a tuning interface, protection or even as a sensor. It needs a full video to describe all resistor types and their application. However, you will see some of them later in this series. I think it's enough for now because we are moving on to the next component. Component number two, capacitors. Capacitors are used to store electric charge and release that charge when it is needed in the circuit. They are one of the most important electronic components and you have to learn how to use them. Otherwise, you will lose many advantages from these lovely components. There are many capacitor types, each with its own specific features, electrolytic, ceramic, polyester, tantalum, etc. In this video, I do not intend to explain the difference between different capacitor types. I am going to explain common features of all capacitors. This is a schematic symbol of an ideal capacitor. Some capacitors have polarity, for example, these electrolytic or tantalum capacitors. Some others are non-polarized, like these multi-layer or polyester or ceramic capacitors. This symbol includes both polarized and non-polarized capacitors. 
but these are symbols of a polarized capacitor. You can use an LCR meter to measure the capacitance of capacitors, although some multimeters have ability to measure the capacitance. Capacitors have many parameters and characteristics. I can't cover them all in this video, but we can talk about the capacitance and the voltage rating, which are the most important parameters of any capacitor. The capacitance is the ability of the capacitor to store electric charge. The higher the capacitance, the more charge the capacitor can store, and the voltage rating determines the maximum voltage the capacitor can withstand. Electrolytic capacitors and tantalum capacitors have polarity. Actually, tantalum capacitors are a type of electrolytic capacitors. Look here, this line here indicates the negative lead of the electrolytic capacitor, and this line here indicates the positive terminal of a tantalum capacitor. You may ask, what is the difference among these capacitor types? To understand the difference, you have to know about ideal capacitors. This is the schematic symbol by which we determine a capacitor. Actually, this is a symbol of an ideal capacitor, not a real one. An ideal capacitor has no resistance or inductance, but a real-world capacitor acts a bit differently. Actually, a real capacitor has at least two resistors and one inductor inside. This is the basic model of a real capacitor. This is an ideal capacitor inside a real capacitor along with two resistors and one inductor. The difference between these capacitor types is in the value and range of these resistors and this inductor. This difference makes them suitable for particular applications and usages. I know you have many questions around this subject. What is the difference between capacitor types? Where to use electrolytic, where to use tantalum, where to use polyester, questions like this. To be honest, this is not subject of this video and there is no time to answer these questions in this video. I will cover more details around the subject in one of my upcoming videos and I will answer most of questions on your mind around the subject. So if you are afraid of missing that video, subscribe to my channel now and simply wait for that video. Now is the time to move on to the next component, but before that, I'm proud to introduce the sponsor of this video. A big thanks to the sponsor of this video, PCBWay.com. They are experts in making high quality circuit boards. If you need a PCB for your project, then check out the PCBWay.com for fast, affordable and reliable services. PCBWay.com provides many services including PCB fabrication, CNC machining, 3D printing and more to help you get started on your electronic journey with confidence. In addition, they offer excellent customer support to guide you through every step. Click the link in the description to explore their services. Well, we have to move on to the next component. Next component is component number three, thermo switches. This is a temperature switch, which is so simple to use. You can use it to make awesome projects. Of course, you need to add a little bit of creativity. These are schematic symbols of a thermostat. It has two leads and the component acts as an automatic switch that is sensitive to heat. A thermo switch has three main parameters, a temperature rating, the maximum voltage it can switch, and the maximum current it can withstand. For example, this one is a 40 degree Celsius thermostat that can switch 250 volts load and is able to pass 5 amperes of current. Voltage and current are very clear and I don't need to explain more about them, but the temperature rating has a point I have to mention. The temperature rating determines a specific temperature and shows a point at which the component changes its state. I mean, when the temperature is under temperature rating of the component, then the component is in its normal state, and when the temperature exceeds the temperature rating of the component, then it changes its state. You may wonder why I didn't say switch on or off, and I used change state instead. I have a good reason for that. There are two main types of thermo switches, normally closed and normally open. Let's assume that the temperature rating for both of them is 40 degrees. 
NC or normally closed means that when the temperature is below the rating, the switch is closed. I mean, the switch will pass electricity and turn on the load. And when the temperature exceeds 40 degrees, the switch will turn off the load. This type is usually used to control a heater and keep the temperature at a maximum of 40 degrees. On the other hand, the NO or normally open is on the opposite side of the NC. I mean, it is open when the temperature is below 40 degrees and it will pass the electricity when the temperature exceeds 40 degrees Celsius. NO is usually used to switch a cooler or a fan to keep the temperature at a maximum of 40 degrees. I haven't got a heater here so I'm gonna use this bulb as a heater I'm gonna use this power cord to bring main voltage to my breadboard note that in this experiment I'm dealing with main electricity and I have to be careful don't try this experiment at home if you are not experienced there is a risk of death in doing this experiment It's working just fine. When the temperature reaches 40 degrees Celsius, the thermo switch turns off the bulb. You can find thermo switches in many home appliances like dishwashers, laundry machines, electric coffee pots, etc. They are very useful but not as useful as the next component. The next component is my favorite. Component number four, buzzers. Buzzers are widely used components in modern devices. Everywhere you look, you will find a device that a buzzer is used in it. Microwave ovens, refrigerator panels, washing machines, etc. It is used to give alerts to the user and make user interface more enjoyable. Buzzers are available in various shapes, types and voltages. These tiny black cylinder packages are more common though. Buzzers are divided into two main categories, active buzzers and passive buzzers. Both of these are schematic symbols for buzzers. There is no difference between passive or active buzzer schematic symbols. Active buzzers have oscillator circuit inside them to produce beep sound. This one is an active buzzer. They are super easy to use. Just apply 5 volt to its terminals and it's done. The buzzer will start making beep sounds until the voltage exists on its terminal. But a passive buzzer is a bit difficult to use. You have to make a pulse with a specific frequency and apply the pulse to buzzer's pin and then it will make a beep sound. Here I am going to use my function generator to produce pulse. Using an active buzzer is so easy and you don't need a function generator. You may ask why do you have to use a passive buzzer when there are active buzzers? Active buzzers can produce beep sounds only at a specific and predefined frequency, but by using a passive buzzer, you can produce beep sounds at a desired frequency or even play music. You see, the beep sound can be customized by changing pulse frequency and if you are using a passive buzzer. Just note that buzzers have polarity and you have to apply the voltage in right polarity. There is a mark on the package to determine the positive terminal. You may remember the sound that all dial-up modems used to make when communicating. I mean this sound. Can you tell me which type of buzzer was used in those old dial-up modems? Active or passive? 
Write your opinion in comment section below. Now is the time for the next component, component number 5, knock sensor. Knock sensors are used to detect sudden movements. A knock sensor will be activated if something hits it. They are used for turning on something, an alarm, airbag, or even to trigger an activity. Look at this toy ball. There is a knock sensor inside the ball. If you hit the ball somewhere, it starts working and turn on RGB LED chaser like this. This is a knock sensor. Look here. It has two terminals, this one and this one. When the sensor hits somewhere, it connects these two terminals together. The mechanism of operation of a knock sensor is so simple. It consists of a spring and a pin inside it. One of its terminals is connected to the pin and another one is connected to the spring. When the knock sensor hits somewhere, it causes the spring to bend and touch the pin and then it acts like a switch connecting two metal objects together. I am gonna use an active buzzer to test the sensor. Look here, when I shake the sensor, the beep sound comes out of the buzzer. The mechanism of operation of a knock sensor was very simple. Anyway, the last but not the least item on the list is component number 6, the NTC. NTC stands for negative temperature coefficient. It refers to a type of thermistor, a temperature sensitive resistor whose resistance increases as its temperature decreases and decreases as its temperature increases. Let's see what it is exactly. This is an NTC. NTCs are available in several resistance ratings. This one is 10 kilo ohm, which means that the resistance between these two terminals must be 10 kilo ohm at a specific temperature, which is usually 25 degrees Celsius or room temperature. It's about 10 kilo ohm, which means that the temperature here is about 25 degrees Celsius. If I warm it up using the slider, the resistance value should get lower. And if I cool it down using this freeze spray, the resistance value will get higher. NTCs are not so precise and the resistance between its terminals may contain errors about 1% or 2%. However, for insensitive projects, you can use them with a carefree mind. This video was just an introduction to six components. Using them in real-world projects require more knowledge and more experience. I will cover more details about each component in project videos and I will cover more components in next episodes. So my friend, this video is ending. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something new. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the thumbs up button and if you like this video, make sure to subscribe for more.